Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, second session of family catechesis, uh, the parent session, and the older kids uh, should be in this room. Anybody in eighth grade and below should be um, with Miss Patty who, or with Miss Lou. Um, they're probably going to be outside doing a little activity um, on faith. So we'll go ahead and begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for uh, having the chance to have celebrated the sacred liturgy, to enter into uh, this time of worship and grace. Uh, we ask that as we still bask in the glow of receiving communion, that we may have our hearts and minds uh, open to the truth you wish to impart to us, that we may be filled with grace to share that truth, to proclaim the faith uh, to our own friends and family, uh, and that all of this may work for your glory and our salvation. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so October is the first real um, lesson where we're learning, and we're beginning with um, the beginning of our faith with the creed. So we'll be spending this whole year going over the creed and talking about what the different articles of faith mean. Uh, that, you know, the big long creed we say at Mass every day, I don't know how many of us have really gone through and studied and understood it. So we start with faith. We're going to start with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And that's about as far as we're going to get today. We'll take it a step at a time. So um, to, start, to start, I want to sort of share a little bit of my own one of my own struggles with faith when I was younger. Um, some of you may have heard part of this story before. Uh, I was born and raised Catholic, went to Catholic middle and high school. You know, I always believed the faith when I was in high school, um, kind of took it seriously. Uh, you know, I did well in almost of, most of my classes, including religion. I had some great teachers who really um, was able to pass the faith on to me in a, in a convincing way. Um, but then in college, as so many of us do, I drifted a little bit. Um, it didn't help that I, you know, I was in the, it was in the honor society, which at uh, most college campuses is a super secular group of people. Um, a lot of intelligent people, a lot of talented people, but who are very cocky and they, they look down on faith and believers. And so I was in a different group of people. I went from being in a Catholic school with all Catholic friends to being at a college surrounded by intelligent people who looked down at the faith. Um, and so I just didn't have the support. I don't, remember ever being directly attacked for my faith, but I just did not have the support and the community for it. Um, and I ultimately struggled with the ability to live what I believed, right? It's one thing to say, I believe what the Catholic Church teaches. It's another thing to live up to what she teaches, particularly in some of the moral demands. As a young single man, there are certain you know, difficulties that come with, what does it mean to live a good and holy life? Um, and I found uh, that this is very, very true. Fulton Sheen once said, if you do not live what you believe, you will end up believing what you live. And as I struggled more and more with, um, with a, an unhealthy relationship, with not going to mass, with not praying at all, right? I mean, you know, was, at Catholic school, we pray every day, but I got to college, I don't know if I really prayed on my own. And so I wasn't praying. I wasn't living out the moral life. I wasn't going to mass every weekend. Some weekends I was. Um, and just gradually, like, what I knew to be true in high school sort of faded into the back of my mind. Um, and I remember all the time traveling around campus, riding my bike, going to classes when the bells of the church would ring. I would always kind of ping my conscience just a little bit. Like, I, I'm pretty sure I still believe this, but I'm not living it, and I'm not sure if I want to believe it anymore. Sometimes I was in that position of like, I believe, but I don't want to believe anymore. I wish it wasn't true. Um, and there were different times when I would try to like pick myself back up and go back to Mass, and I go to confession periodically. And one time in confession with uh, Father Chester Arsenault, who's now the pastor at the cathedral, um, I remember talking to him about, like, I'm struggling to believe my faith, um, because I knew I wasn't living it. And he said, well, you know, I would point you to the martyrs, the example of the martyrs. So these are men and women who gave up everything, who suffered and died for what they believed. And, you know, that if it's not true, then we have something, it's hard to explain that, right? What, what can cause someone to go through what they went through and bearing witness to this faith? If it's not true, 
right? Well, what does explain that? But if it is true, then we know there is grace, and we should draw strength and courage from that example. I mean, it spoke to me particularly because, like, they died to live their faith, and I was struggling to live my faith, so I was struggling to believe. Um, and it always sort of stuck with me, right, that faith is a supernatural ability. Um, and as I was able to break away from that relationship and return to the full practice of my faith, um, I've always that's always been a, a special place in my heart, my mind, like the martyrs, an example to look up to. And in those moments of difficulty and struggle, when I struggle with living the faith, maybe not believing it, but with living it, there's the, you know, let me look to the martyrs. Let me ask their intercession and draw on the strength of their example. And so um, I would commend that same example to you as we're talking about the faith and learning it. Like some of this is very hard. We're going to get into some very difficult things to li live and believe in today's world. Not today, but down the road. Um, and so just to, to be going back to that example of the martyrs who bore that witness to the faith, who like Jesus Christ died for the truth. So um, with that being said, that's sort of an intro story just to share a little bit about my own journey. And now we'll, we'll dive into the lesson here. So it will set, set the stage with a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, and this is this is a participation point. All right. So I need uh, people to raise hands or to shout out or something. Who are we most likely to believe? Who are you most likely to believe in general? It doesn't have to be faith. Who just in general when it comes to believing or trusting someone? Who are you most likely to believe? Parents, right? I mean, you know, even now, do you still believe your parents now? Yeah. Particularly as children, right? That's the second question. Like, particularly as children, we tend to believe our parents, right? Uh, funny story. My mom's probably going to kill me if I tell this, but oh well. Um, she may not see this. My mom wanted me to eat mushrooms. We wouldn't eat them, me and my little brother. So she told us that mushrooms are brain food. Brain food. They help you, you know, grow and smarter. And so my brother and I, oh, okay, we'll eat that. It turns out they not at all. They're helpful for other things, vitamins and minerals, but they are not helpful for brain growth or for memory or any of that. So like, she, she lied to us. But we believed her. And I, I'm telling you, I found this out last year. <laughs> Right, I believed her that whole life. You know, unfortunately, and other things, more important things, she was honest. Right, you know, you just you find yourself sometimes telling these little white lies to get your kids to do what they got to do. Um, you know, like none of the limbs in here, like Santa Claus, right? You know, just. Um, but you know, they they trust us, and they we we help them to understand there's a difference between the little things like mushrooms and Santa Claus, and the big things like Jesus Christ and faith, um, and what matters in life. So what are some qualities or behaviors others display that make you more likely to believe them? What do you look for in a person's behavior to make them seem trustworthy? Calm, not anxious, right? Yeah, there's a certain serenity that comes from that. Eye contact. Oh, yeah, they can look at... Yeah, if they can look you in the eye and tell you this, what they're saying, right? Confident, right? They say it with boldness. I mean, that's, that's how people get elected. Well, they're confident, even if they aren't telling the truth. But they, they're, they're, they're hijacking our psychology, right? Like, they, they're they hijacking our stuff. Like, I'm, if I can make eye contact and say this confident, they're going to believe me, even though I know it's not true. Right? Because on some level, that's supposed to be part of the truth. Because when you know you're right, you, you stand your ground. Anything else? Any other? What's another behavior you look for for somebody to be trustworthy? You believe what they're saying. Yeah, they they live out their own example. They say it and then they do it. You know. Um, okay. Let's see. Here. Now, how do we find someone who is able to do something for us that we cannot do for ourselves? Right. As my dad always said, either do it yourself or pay someone to do it. Well, how do you find someone you trust enough to pay to do it? If you're, if say you need you need some work done on the pipes in the house, how do you find a plumber? Yeah, someone else refers it to you. Um, any other insights? I don't think there are websites nowadays, and you go for that. Yeah, I mean, I just I asked Susan. You know. Susan, we have a good plumber. Yes, yes. Okay, we'll call him Michelle. Anyway, we have an electrician. Oh, you know, who who does carpentry? You know, because um, the parish secretary knows everybody. She's the one who really runs this parish. Okay, so 
um, this idea of trust, right? With the whole idea of a referral, I look up somebody, I ask somebody who's had a good experience. I trust this person because my friend, my neighbor said they did good work on um, you know, the pipes or this doctor was kind and compassionate, understanding and helped me deal with my condition. Especially with doctors, I'm super picky <laughs> about doctors because we've, had, we've all had that experience where we're just kind of blown off. Like they come in, they barely listen to your symptoms, they throw some pills at you and they walk away. Like that's not, but I hear, oh, this doctor was great. And I was like, oh, I want, I want that doctor because my friend had a good experience with them. And so I trust them vicariously. This idea of I have faith in this person because of someone else's experience, because of their testimony. Um, and so obviously we're, we're comparing this over to faith of coming to know God. And there are really three ways to know God that we're going to cover today. Knowing God exists through reason, knowing who he is through revelation, and then having faith. And we'll find that faith is a, is a, a layered reality. Um, knowing that God exists through reason, knowing who he is through revelation, revelation, and then having faith, accepting him, and living that truth. Um, and sort of, uh, you know, there's, there, you can see this example of like, you think about it at dance, right? Maybe some of the younger kids or some of the kids will remember this more vividly, but like at a dance, right? There's, um, you know, there's a, there's a girl, she's, she's standing, you know, on the side of the dance floor and she sees a guy, like, okay, there's a guy there who could potentially dance with me, right? At this point, she, she knows he's there through her eyes, through her reason. Um, and it, there's something about him that's interesting. It's caught her eye. She wants to dance with him, but she doesn't know him yet. Um, but then eye contact, right? That moment, the jolt. Either fear or excitement or both, right? Now they both recognize that they're there, and he comes over to her, um, and then invites her into that dance, right? So until up until this point, she's been acting on what she can see and know through her own reason. But when he invites her to dance with him, she's got to okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna follow his lead. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna dance with him, and then I'm gonna come to know about him through the dancing while they're talking, depending on how crazy loud the music is. Um, and this sort of sort of relationship begins. And so, like, the point is that we can know that God exists through our reason. You don't need faith at all to know that there is a God, like seeing the man across the room. Um, but if we want to know about him, who he is, what kind of God this is, there is revelation. There is conversation with God where he tells us about himself. So... Um, what reason tells us about God? We can know that God exists through reason by looking at the external world and by looking at the human person. Um, I mean, there's the basic, where did everything come from? And there's a lot of scientific theories about that, but they all start with some assumption. I think it's Stephen Hawking said, give me gravity and I can explain the whole universe. To which I say, where'd you get gravity? There's... There is something, not nothing. The fact that there is something tells us there's probably something on a different level that caused this world to exist. The reason we say that is because when we look at the world, everything in the world exists now, but will one day not exist. There's nothing that human beings have ever discovered that will just go that won't just go away, that will fade or break or change over time. And so the question is like if this world is so temporary and changing and inconsistent, what caused it to be in the first place? There must be a different kind of thing that plays by different rules that created this world. That thing we call God. That God operates at the level of the eternal. He does not change. He does not go away. And he never didn't exist. But our universe does. And so like the idea that there is a world that exists tells us there's probably something that created that world. Um, you know, if you're walking through the woods and you come across a house, you don't go, oh, look, logs fell together and formed a house. You go, oh, somebody built that. We also know that God exists because the world is ordered. There is a structure. There are laws. And the way that the world works, and it, it looks designed. And so we say, well, then someone designed it. Well, the person who designed it, we call God. And then, of course, we get it by looking at the human person. Um, there's just an innate desire of the human person to believe in God. The default assumption is that there is a God. Every human culture 
has starts with some sort of belief, religious belief, gods, spirits. There are different ways it forms. Atheism is extraordinarily rare and unnatural. Human beings kind of start with this belief in a greater power of some kind. But also we look at human beings, we have desires. Like other animals, we desire things. I want to eat food, and I know because I'm hungry that food does exist. I may not have some, but I know that it exists. Right? We crave things that are real. Our, our desires are ordered to things that exist. We crave companionship because other people exist. And we know that that desire can be fulfilled on some level. Um, and this includes the sexual desire, the desire to have children. Those things are possible. Every desire we can name has something in the world that exists. Well, human beings desire happiness, permanent happiness. But as far as we can tell on this earth, there is no permanent happiness. We desire something that doesn't appear to exist. So we infer from that, well, if I have this desire for permanent happiness, there must be something that's capable of giving that. And that thing is what we call God. Again, this is all without faith. A human being can come to this conclusion, there must be this greater being that can produce happiness, that designed this world, that made things exist. Um, why is it that we always are looking for the perfect person? The young are particularly bad about this. And they fall in love and they find the perfect person. We desire to be in a relationship with somebody perfect, we, but we never find someone perfect. Maybe there must, there must be a perfect person if that desire exists. That perfect person is God. I may not know him, but I know that there must be someone like that. Um, and so, in this, and this is the church's teaching, and how it has been. It is possible to prove that God exists with reason alone. And there are a lot of different arguments and ways to do that. The fact that it's able to be proved and convincing someone that it's true are two different things. I want to make that very clear. We can say, oh yeah, that's true and I can prove it, doesn't mean they're going to believe it. Most of the atheist arguments can be defeated, but you're still not going to convince the atheist. But that does come down to the human being is naturally capable of figuring out that a God exists. So we know that what God is, creator, designer, perfect person, all-powerful, but we don't know who he is. Um, here. Yeah, so because of certain conclusions that we can do, and this is, you know, a whole field of philosophy is dedicated to reasoning out what does God look like. Um, Aristotle, ancient Greek philosopher before Jesus, didn't have Jewish scripture, didn't have any of that, came to the conclusion that there must be a God who sounds an awful lot like the God we know. He came to the conclusion that there must be a being that is all-powerful, right? Because he sees the different levels of power in this world. He says that there must be an ultimate standard, and that ultimate standard of power is what we call God. There's a difference between good and evil. The ultimate standard of good must be that thing we call God. He must be all-knowing. He must be eternal. He must be unchanging, because it's the only thing that could produce this world without being in this world. But it's still all kind of vague. What does all-powerful mean? What does all-knowing mean? What does that how do I have a relationship with this being? Well, that's when we get into the who. Not just what about him, but who he is. Which means to know revelation. Um, and the good news is, in that example of the dance that I gave, right? the girl locked eyes with the guy, but he came to her. So the good news is, in the dance of life, of searching for meaning in the cosmos, God is the dance partner who initiates. It's like looking across the floor. We see that there is a God, but he comes to us so we get the chance to know him, to say yes to that invitation to dance. Um, I also like to use the story of a marriage proposal. Right? He's the one proposing. We say yes, we come to know who he is. Uh, so divine revelation is God revealing himself directly to the human race. So we talk about revelation, not just the book in the Bible. There's a book in the Bible called Revelation. There is no S, by the way, a little pet peeve of mine. It's the book of Revelation, not Revelations. Um, but revelation in general is this term we talk about everything that God tells us about himself. Uh, and he does this directly. So, move on to the next slide. We know that it begins um, 
thinking back to this example, we were talking about finding somebody who I can trust to work on the piping, pipes in my house for the electrical. Right? I get a referral. I talk to somebody who knows this person who can tell me that they're trustworthy. Well, revelation for us begins with trusting other people. Um, it begins with the Old Testament, where God reveals himself to certain individuals. Adam and Eve got to know God right off the bat, but after Cain and Abel, God fades into the background. Um, and it's a while before he steps back in and says, hey, I'm the God who created your parents and grandparents and so on, and I have something I want you to do. I want you to build a boat. I'm going to flood the world right, with Noah. And then with Abraham, he's like, I want you to move, change countries, go over here, have a bunch of kids, and you'll all of those kids will one day come back and completely control this country. Right? This, this God who reveals himself and has this plan unto himself, but we know about these things through scripture, the stories that have been handed on to us of God's relationship with other people. They are referring God, the ultimate plumber, electrician, whatever, doctor, to us. And so we know about him through other people. Um, and so we have the patriarchs and the prophets in the scriptures. And those are all sort of referrals. But then he comes himself. We make the call. right? The human race was okay, responding to God imperfectly, and then finally he comes in, him, in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the fullest revelation. And so um, what we're gonna, we say is that like everything we know about God is summed up in Jesus Christ because he is God. He comes to reveal himself. And so all the Old Testament ultimately points to Jesus and makes the most sense in Jesus Christ, which is why we don't just ignore the Old Testament because ultimately it helps us understand Jesus, which is why we have to be careful about interpreting the Old Testament without Jesus, which is where you can get some pretty crazy Christian denominations out there who, who believe in some terrible things because, oh, that's in the Old Testament. Yeah, but you have to understand, the Old Testament's the referral. Jesus is the person. <laughs> He's going to tell us, oh, you misunderstood what this person said about me. And so we read the Old Testament in light of Jesus Christ. Of course, we're 2,000 years removed from Jesus, right? I mean, he's not standing right here. Um, I mean, we say that he exists in the priest in a certain sense, but like, there's still like, I'm still Father Albert. <laughs> How do I know about this Jesus Christ? Um, and again, it, it keeps coming back to this element of trust. Um, that we know that he can be mystically present to us in the Eucharist and the sacraments through personal prayer, the Holy Spirit. Um, but how do we know about Jesus and the Revelation? Well, it's because those who have come to know Jesus wrote it down and handed on and passed along this referral, this relationship with Jesus Christ. We break it down to two basic categories. Right? Jesus Christ is the fullest revelation of Jesus. How do we know Jesus? Fullest revelation of God. How do we know Jesus, who is God? Scripture and tradition. Scripture and tradition. And we keep coming back to that, right? The Bible tells us about God, but so does tradition. Jesus did not come to give us a book. I say this all the time. I've said it from the pulpit, I'm sure. But it can't be said. Jesus did not give us a book. He didn't write a single word. We don't ever know him writing anything down. And when he rose into heaven... There was no Bible. It was it was a couple hundred years after Jesus that we had what we call the Bible in a full form, all set together and collected. The Old Testament was out there, but people had to put it together and say, this is the Bible. He came to give us himself. He came to make us part of his body, the community of the church. And the church is a living, breathing thing that hands on through tradition. And this is where a lot of Christians part ways with us. Like, oh, it's sold as scripture. Only, only by the Bible do we know Jesus. No. The Bible absolutely tells us about Jesus, but we know him by tradition. It's the difference between reading a book about your family and living with your family. You might read books about the traditions, the things that your parents and grandparents did. You might have the scrapbooks and the albums. That's great. That tells me about your family. But if I go to dinner with your family, I'm going to learn things I can't learn in a book. And so what we know about Jesus, we read about, yes. We know about it through experience and tradition, through going to Mass, through prayer together, through community, through the sacraments. Right? All seven sacraments are there in the scripture, but there's not a detailed list of how to celebrate the when and where. That's all part of tradition. And so everything we're going to cover and what do we believe is going to refer back to those two sources. Where is it in scripture and tradition? Ultimately, where is it in Jesus Christ? Where has God told us about himself? Um, and this, of course... The biggest moment of encountering this, it's 
stepping away from reason, I know that there is a God, to knowing who God is, the Trinity. You cannot figure out the Trinity. No one had any idea that God was three persons in one God. It's a totally new idea, which is part of the reason the Jews rejected Jesus. is because he's trying to reveal this mystery about himself, and they're just like, that doesn't make any sense. I can't understand that. What you're saying sounds like blasphemy, and that's part of the reason they killed him. Because he claimed to be equal to God as the Son of God with the Father, and then the, the Holy Spirit. And like for the Jews, there was no just there's just one God. And we're like, yeah, there is one God, but that one God is a mysterious exchange of three persons. And they go, what? And to this day, Muslims don't consider us monotheists. They think we're tritheists. We're not. We believe in one God. This is who God is, and the only way you can know this about God. Is beginning to know him, right? The only way you can know about the guy at the dance, his sense of humor and his taste in music, is you talk to him. You're not going to figure out by looking at him, like, I bet he likes Guns N' Roses. Like, I mean, that's a guess. But we couldn't even guess at the Trinity. This is a revelation. Um, and it, this is, we know this through scripture and through the tradition. And the first 300 years of the church was basically people arguing about this fact. What does it mean to have a Trinity? The word Trinity is not in the Bible. It took 300 years for a whole bunch of devout Catholics to argue out and pin down the details. What does it mean to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? How are they three persons and one God? What's the nature of their relationship? Like, where does one begin and the other end? And there's, and it's all boiled down to, like, well, this is what God tells about himself, and we just have to take his word for it. This is, the, this is where we enter into faith, not just reason. Right, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity tells us who is God, what kind of relationship does he invite us into, and it tells us also right, where everything comes from and what is the purpose of life. Right? Who God is, God is relationship between three persons who are still one God. This is why we can say God is love. Love, when we say the word, we think there are two, there's at least two people involved. Right? Love is from one to the other. Well, how can God, who's by himself, perfect, and doesn't need anyone, be love? Well, this is how. He's an exchange of three divine persons who love each other. Again, it's something we can't reason out, but God tells us it's about himself. Which then, of course, tells us, well, what kind of relationship does this God want? Well, if he is love, what do you think he wants? He wants love. He created us out of love. He wants us to love him back. Right, which is good news, right? Because just knowing that there is a God doesn't necessarily guarantee that he's good. There are a lot of people who believe there's a God, but they're not so sure he's a good God. He's all-powerful and all-knowing, sure, but is he good? Look at the world. Mm, I'm not sure. But we know by faith, we know by what he tells us about himself, by the dramatic proof, of like, I'll prove I'm good. I will go and die rather than hurt you. I will let you kill me to show you how much I love you. Right, this is the faith that he wants a relationship of love. Um, right, and where does everything come from? Well, it comes from the fact that this God who is love wanted people to love him back. Wanted to just, he was fine with himself. He was like, you know what? Let's just, I love it so great, I'm going to include some more people. He just, I just want more people to come into that love. Um, and what's the purpose of it? Right, to, to return that love to God. So the only question is, will we accept God's invitation? We know it comes from love. We know that's what he wants. It's the kind of relationship. He's coming and inviting us into that dance of love, and we have to say yes. Or we can awkwardly stand on the corner like middle school girls and, I don't know, I'm scared, you know. It's just actually the boys are ones who are scared more than the girls. Um, so, I mean, if we come to understand that this God is who he says he is, we have faith that he's perfect, right? He's not like other human beings who are going to fail and let us down, who, are, who might, to the best of their intentions, do everything they can to do it right, but still they die, <laughs> and they're going to let you down because of their limitation. God is not limited. God is not dishonest. God will not hurt us. And the thing is that faith is ultimately not a blind leap. Um, I may have given this definition before, but I, a friend of mine who was teaching kids, and he asks, what's faith? And the kid says, faith is when you believe, even though you know it's not true. Faith is when you believe, in the... no, it's not. That's not true. That's... No, faith is true. As a matter of fact, 
you can open your, your parent guide to page, where is it? 11, page 11. In the verse that you're supposed to memorize and your kids are supposed to memorize this month, Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the realization of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen, right? It's not ignoring your reason, right? It's the realization of what is hoped for, meaning it's not here yet, but I realize that it's there. I have faith that it's there. And evidence of things not seen, right? It's evidence of what I can't see. Faith is rooted in trust, not blind obedience. God does not call for blind obedience. He calls for radical obedience, obedience to the point of self-sacrifice, but it's not irrational because I have evidence of what he says. Evidence of things not things. What is the evidence? It is God himself telling us. So faith boils down to this radical trust in what is, might be beyond my reason, but it's not contrary to it. All the time. People are like, oh, the church and science, they going to go, don't get along. That's not true. There's a massive list of PhD scientists who were Catholic priests. The Big Bang Theory, from a priest. Monsignor Lemaire is Lemaitre, is the one who, who came up with the Big Bang Theory. They actually recently renamed it to include his name in the law that's called the Big Bang Theory. Right? We are not contrary to science at all. We're not contrary to reason at all. Faith works with our reason. Our reason tells us, I can trust what this person is telling me about me because he's God, because he has done this throughout history in the Old Testament. He has done this in Jesus Christ. He has done this through and sometimes despite his church. Faith is reasonable. It is not blind. And if God is who he says he is, the all-powerful creator of the universe, the source of love, who better to trust? Um, so faith enters into a relationship with God. It's not just a set of ideas. It is a relationship. So there, this is where we get to, there are basically two layers of faith. When we say the word faith, we can mean two different things. Faith is both the ability to believe, to trust. It is also what we believe. Like the Catholic faith is the creed, right? You can say the creed tells us the Catholic faith, what we believe. There's a God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is the only Son, our Lord. It's, that's what we believe. But the ability to believe it, trust, is also called faith. Right, which is the relationship. It's a, it's a virtue. It's a good habit. The ability to consistently trust what God tells us about Himself. This idea of faith. So I have, I have faith that the faith is true. Right, so we use that word in two different ways. What we believe and the ability to believe are both called faith. Um, and in order to be in a relationship with somebody, you have to believe what they tell you about themselves, at least on some level. If you don't, you shouldn't be in a relationship with them. Boys and girls, if they're still dating, you know, you don't believe what they're saying about themselves. You really should probably break up and figure out if you trust them first. You know, this is why trust is so important to a relationship. I trust that what he's saying about himself is true, and both what he's saying and my trust in him are faith. Already covered that. And here's the thing. Part of this is, just like a relationship, you can't know everything about somebody else. Even a human being. There are going to be things. You could be married 60 years and not know everything about your partner. You're not gonna. How much more so with God? So the fact that you trust God doesn't require you to know everything about God. The fact that you trust the Catholic faith is true doesn't mean you know everything about the Catholic faith. It's, you know... We'll talk about the word consubstantial later on. What, what does that even mean, right? Um, but it's really not a big deal if you don't know the definition of the word. It's, if you have the trust that the faith is true and what you do know you trust is true, it's fine if you don't have the whole thing memorized. You don't have the whole catechism, you know, memorized. Like the, it's fine. All of the teachings of the faith are in here, or most of it. You don't have to know all of it. But you do have a level of trust um, that it is true. And as you come to know more... You start with that attitude of trust. The first instinct when you find out the church teaches this shouldn't be, uh, do I agree? It should be, okay, I trust the church. Let me understand why that's true. 
when we say we're Catholic, the assumption is the church is right. I want to understand how. Not, I don't trust the church. It's got to prove it first. Well, you're not quite believing at that point. You're still skeptical. And there are people, who, I mean, you know, if that's where you are, honestly, well, then be honest with that. See, I'm like, I'm looking at the Catholic faith, which is fine. You know, we have to make that honest journey. But the act of faith, the virtue of faith starts with, I trust the church. When she says this, help me understand it. Also, does she actually say it? That's a whole different question. A lot of people who say Catholic Church says blah, blah, blah. Does she? Does she say that? That's, and if she does, okay, why? I want to understand it. Not, hmm, prove it to me. Again, you're not going to have a healthy marriage if everything your spouse tells you, you're like, hmm, I'm not sure I believe you. Like, there's a default assumption that we're, we're being honest with each other. Right? It's, this should be the same way in our relationship with God, in relationship with the church. And of course, this is the hard part, the part I shared on, is living it. <laughs> There's one thing, yeah, they're right. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but they're right. We get to that place in a relationship too. You know, Sometimes in marriage, like, I know he's right, but I don't want to give in. <laughs> I know she's right, but I don't want to admit that. Right? Just, it's, it's admitting that. It's living that. Um, and I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. This is where we're being irrational. Like, I know God is true. I know he's loving. I know he's telling me the truth. And I know what he's telling me to do is best for me. But I still don't want to do it. All right, this is this is where we get into all the other virtues and grace. Um, and so um, the reason I bring it up now is that over the course of this program, we don't want to forget that this information about God is ultimately ordered towards your relationship with God. It isn't just about being able to take notes and understand what I'm saying, um, or even to tell your kids accurate information, although that is crucial. Knowing your person, knowing a person require, is required to love that person. Um, but we don't want it to just be theoretical. Blah, 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 Father Albert says this. Okay, check, check, fine. We want it to get to the level of like, okay, what does this mean? How do I live this? Um, ultimately, faith requires obedience. If it's true, I need to live it. If I'm going to be in a relationship with God, I have to follow him. Or eventually, I won't even think it's true anymore. That quote Fulton Sheen, if you do not live what you believe, you will begin to believe what you live. Okay, so um, at this point I'm going to transition a little bit. Some notes. Any questions on that so far? There will be some more discussion and some activity later. But that, that's the lecture portion of this uh today. So, okay, we'll, we'll shift a little bit. So, part of what we learn right today is, I believe, we just talked about faith, in God the Father Almighty, right, creator of heaven and earth. And so we'll talk a little bit about creation, right? The Christian family is a reflection of this love of the Trinity, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Father and Son who love each other, the Holy Spirit is the third person, is the love. It's like man and wife love each other, the third person that comes from that is the child, right? There's a certain reflection there. Um, And so um, we said that we know God by looking at the human person. So what we'll do here is we'll look at the image of creation, right? God created Adam, right? This is the creation of Adam. Um, so what part of the Bible does this depict? I answered the first question. Where, where is this picture in the Bible? I mean, not the picture, but what is the picture describing from the Bible? Like what, what chapter? Give me, can someone give me a book and a chapter? Genesis what? Which chapter is it? I'm going to call on people. I'm going to pick on Kayla. What chapter do you think it is? You don't know? Pick, pick a number. One, yeah. Genesis 1 and 2. All right, the creation of Adam. Right, of course, Adam's on the left. God and the Father is on the right. Um... And you may not be able to see it well in this. The people online probably see it. But you see there's a face right here? Who do you think that is? All right, this is Adam, and that's God. Who's God got under his arm behind him? Eve, yeah. He's getting ready to give Eve to Adam. Um, the creation of Adam and Eve from the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and 2. Um, so look at the posture Right, um, 
medieval painters have a lot of weird postures. I don't know if you've looked at a lot of medieval art. They're all kind of weird position. But there's reasons for that. They mean something. So look at the positioning of Adam, right? How he's sitting and the way that God is acting, right? Um, who's got more energy in this painting? Right. Yeah, God has more energy in this painting. So um, why do you think that is? Why do you think that um, they decided to paint it in this way where Adam is kind of chilling back and God is the one leaning forward with energy, who's the active one? There's no wrong answers. He's inviting him to dance. I mean, yes, sort of, yeah, to, to use our analogy that we started with. But God's the creator. God's the initiator. Adam is passive. God is active. right? Because Adam is being created. God is doing the creation. Um. Oh, that's an interesting point. Um, I don't think I ever noticed that. The leg and foot are an almost exact replica. I didn't realize that. It's hard to see in this. The, this, this leg and this leg are very similar. I never noticed that before. I was just looking at the notes. Um, right, this idea that we're in the image and likeness of God, right? So our leg looks like God's leg, right? Is that what that means? Not quite, but that's the point. Um, and so, from what I understand, so Michelangelo painted this. From what I understand, initially, their fingers were touching. But the, um, I think it was the Pope, or maybe it was the Cardinal in charge of it, asked him to paint it where they weren't touching. Why? Why do you think their hands are almost, but not quite touching? So, yeah, there's, there's, there's a, they're not, they're not one yet. There's a distance. Right. Right. I mean, is, of course, we have to ask the question, like, you know, if, if God's going to create Adam and Eve, we know what happens right after Adam and Eve are created. You know, it's all paradise for a very short time, for about a day, and then Adam and Eve mess it up, right? And then there's there's a distance between them, right? And like, Adam is all like, whatever, you know, like if God wants whatever, you know, like, but God is like reaching out to get, and this is this is the reality of, of salvation. Right? It's, God is chasing after us. He's reaching for us, and we're kind of like, eh, baby. I think about it. Oh yeah. Look at the shape of this, right? This this cloth that's behind, it kind of looks like a human brain. Which I want to know how Michelangelo knows what a brain looks like. That's I kind of want to know because they didn't have, you know, science textbooks or internet pictures of brains, but it kind of looks like a brain behind, right? This idea um if part of the creation is, is that God gives us intelligence. All right. So we're going to do small groups now. So um, if you want to get into groups of six, as much as you feel comfortable, if you're, you know, a group of people you're already comfortable being close to, we're going to do, each of you are going to have a couple of questions. You're going to spend a little bit of time answering them, and then we'll talk about the answers. So. Nope, sorry. Here you all go. Who do you want to group with? Here you go. And so some of the groups have different questions. And uh, in pages 240 to 243 in the parent guide have two essays based on the lessons for this month. Uh, you might be able to find some of the answers in there.
and I'll put this up on the video. And uh, as a group, y'all should each nominate the one person who's going to present um, your answers. Not all of the answers, but some of them. And the person writing should probably not be the presenter, so it's a way to get out of it. If you're doing the writing, you're immune. Yeah, and don't be afraid of wrong answers. It's the best way to learn.
okay if uh, I want to start wrapping it up. Another two minutes or so, and we'll we'll come together and talk about the answers. By the way, the people on the internet can't hear you; they can only hear me. So don't don't worry about that. Yeah, we're 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 recording and streaming for those few who feel don't feel safe. Like there's a couple of families who need compromise to that sort of thing, but they can't see or hear you. They can only see and hear me. And if you really just enjoyed the lecture and you want to watch it again, you can. All right, let's uh Let's turn our attention back as a, as a big group. We will do, we'll go over the questions. So there are, there are four different sets of questions out there. I think who, who's got group, who's got group one at the top of their page? Y'all, any other group ones? Who's got a group two out there? Group two's there. Is it three? Who's a three? Y'all got three, two. Okay. So we have two sets of two. All right. So, okay. Well, let's see here. Um, group one, let's pick out a question here. Uh, question four, our culture trends tends to treat love as a feeling, but love is not a feeling, it's a choice. How does Jesus' life show us this truth? What's y'all's answer? Group. Is not yours? Maybe it's sorted differently. Let me look here. How oh, you would think? Huh, Okay. Why don't you give us your number four, which is why is placing our faith in God different than placing our faith in any human being? That is good. Yeah, that's because God does not fail like humans. So that's funny. They put these questions in a different order than they gave them to you. Why do they do that to me? Okay, let's see here. Um... Give us question number two as well. Um, God created us with the free will, the ability to choose right and wrong. How does the free will affect the meaning of the faith? Well, that's that's right. I'm just seeing how they put it. I don't know why it's a different. Hmm. Okay. Seems to be a misprint here. Group two. We got a couple of group twos, so. All right. Uh, group two, why don't you give us uh, your question number six? What is it for? Which of God's attributes is most awesome to you? What would y'all put? Forgiveness. Yeah, that's the one that we all count on the most. Mercy. Can't get that wrong. No, that's absolutely right. Oh, that's why. I'm the wrong section of the book. Oh, there we go. Now I'm in the right place. I was in November. Sorry, y'all. Time is tricky. Okay. Uh, group two, why don't you... The other group two. Who's the other group two? All right. Why don't you give us... Um, all right. Number seven. A mystery is truth entirely above our reason, but not contrary to it. We believe it because God revealed it. Which attribute of God do you believe is most mysterious?
Yeah, so that I mean, yeah, that's that's a it's a good way of like wrestling with um with mystery, right? That's because the idea is like faith is, um, this ability like I have to accept something that I can't prove, right? And there's and it actually doesn't give a specific answer, but just it's interested in seeing how you reason that out, right? The mystery that I have to trust something beyond myself, and still be a reasonable person, right? There's a whole tension there. I like that answer. All right, group three. Let's see here. Why don't you pick a question and give me an answer? Another way of saying God is Trinity, how does this help us know that God is love? So they just the, you talk about the sort of trust between the persons of the Trinity, right? There's this totality, right? Because you know it's infinitely they you know, they all have um, full knowledge, right? So there's this this total radical trust between them. Oh, I like that. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let me pick it. Now I'm going to pick a question. How does making the sign of the cross connect to the Trinity? Oh man, that's too easy. Number ten. Right, yeah. The belief in the Trinity, which is an exchange of love, and then the belief in the passion of Jesus Christ, which is his act of love on our behalf. Right, and because that's why we do the cross, but say the Trinity's name, because it's that joining of love. I love it. All right. And number four. Who's group four? All right, group four. Um, what are some things you can discern about who God is by observing his creation? What can we figure out about God by looking at his creation? Right, yeah, so through uh, the childbirth, through new life in plants and animals, right, this idea that um, God is this source of life, where we see he creates this world that it produces life and joy and happiness, and that certainly tells us a lot about God. Let's see. Um, what did God create the world out of, and can anyone else do it that way? Group four. Okay, so, yeah, he created us out of love and from the dust of the earth. It does say that. So, um, the answer it's fishing there for is like creation of everything, right? The dust itself, he created out of nothing. Um, the technical term there is ex nihilo, which means it's Latin for out of nothing, meaning there was nothing but God, and God created out of nothing. And yeah, he's the only one who can do that. Um, we have to take stuff and turn it into other stuff, but he can take nothing and make stuff. Only God can do that. Um, all right. Let's pull this back up. All right, this is the large group sharing. Okay, so at this point we will transition to um, a summary of sort of the key points of the readings this month. So those essays I pointed you to um, in the back of the book. So every month there will be two essays that basically summarize the teaching of what it is you're supposed to hand on to your child. Um, and so you, you can wait until after the meeting or you can read it before the parents' meeting, um, but you really should read those essays at the very least um, in order to be able to adequately teach your child the lessons of your children, the lessons of this month. Um, but then we'll summarize sort of the key points in that reading, right? Faith is a gift from God. We need it for salvation and it requires we swallow God's commands. And it is summarized in the Apostles' Creed. And yeah, to drive home this point, faith is not a blind leap. Um, we are not irrational because we trust God, because he's given us reason to trust him. So faith is a gift. You cannot convince someone to believe the Catholic faith. There is a grace that has to take place. We can make it look less stupid. <laughs> we can make it look reasonable. We can defend ourselves. But at the end of the day, you cannot argue someone into being Catholic. You can just argue away the obstacles that allow grace to give them the gift of faith, to believe, to trust someone. Just like you can argue that your friend is trustworthy, but until they trust your friend, they're not going to trust them. That's just that's how it's going to work. right? And we need it to be saved. Faith is required for salvation. And summarized in the Apostles' Creed, um, which is the shorter version of the creed we say at Mass. Okay. 
other key points, um, we can know God both through revelation and his creation, um, which is why we like science, which is why we like discovery, um, which is why a lot of scientists were Catholic priests and monks throughout history, because we like to study his creation to know him. But we also get to hear from him about himself. Um, and then unlike other creatures, human beings are made in the image of God. The main way that we reflect the image of God is our intelligence, our free will, and the two of those combined, the ability to love. That we can know someone and choose to do what is good for them is an act of love. Animals are not capable of this, just to make that distinction. Right? Animals have instinct. Right? They can figure things out. They might even be clever, but they do not ponder the mysteries of the universe and the meaning of life. They do not create art and poetry. They do what their instincts tell them to do. And we can train those instincts, but at the end of the day, they do not have intelligence. Same thing with free will. We can freely choose. Animals just follow whatever instincts or you know, biological pro programming they've got. And which is why, like, yeah, our dogs love us on a certain like chemical, biological level, but they don't love us like we love each other or like Jesus loves, right? It's a different kind of, they love us. It's, it's sheerly emotional and instinctive, but we can love even against our emotions and instinct. Like, you can, I can actually find you totally revolting, but still love you. Like that's human beings are capable of that, um, which is profound, right? Like God loved us and died for us as sinners. God, the blessed Trinity, three divine persons, one God. It's the central mystery of the faith. And then, of course, I believe in Father Almighty, right? God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth. So now the hard part. Actually, it's not the hard part, but it might feel like it. Teaching to your children, okay? So the goal of this program is your faith formation. I am focused on helping you to understand and live the faith, everybody in this room, okay? That is the primary goal. Children and younger siblings, or you know, nephews, nieces, whatever it is, your relationship to the child you're educating, learn from your example primarily. So for me, a success is getting you to grow in your faith and to understand it, and then the effect of that on the children in your care, the people you're educating, okay? Um, so now we can look at pages eight and nine to do some of the technical stuff, but you do have to, you know, put some work in, you know, we, we gotta look at that. So you look at pages eight and nine in your parent's guide, you'll see the overview, okay? Uh, on eight, you'll see lesson one, I believe, and nine, you'll see lesson two, God the Father Almighty, okay? Um, and you'll see under each overview, it'll give the words to know, right? That's the vocab for the month. Right? The goal is for your kids to learn all of those vocab words. I mean, depending on their level, if they're really little, pick one or two they want to do. You're like, you know the level of your child. I'm not going to grade them and like fail you because your kid didn't know the vocab, okay? <laughs> like this. So, but this is the goal. You want to impart the knowledge of these terms to your children over the course of this month for each of these two lessons. Um, you also see the catechism articles to read. Okay, so you really do need to read those essays in the back, which summarize what those catechism articles say. However, I highly encourage you to at least look at those catechism articles and at least skim over them or read them because you will find it, I mean, it's much more thorough. Some of it's beautiful, some of it's dense, but um, some of it is very, very clear and easy to understand. And at the end of each chapter, there's a little summary. So just to look at the catechism articles so that you can hear directly from the source, like what does the church teach? And that's always a good question. If you want to know what the church teaches, you look in this book, which is why each lesson gives you where in this book the lesson is coming from, not just making it up. So yeah, there's the catechism articles read and then the words to know that you want to teach. And of course, by the end of this month, your children should be able to, those are your learning goals. <clears throat> Page 11 is what they call the fridge page. You'll see that there's little cutout marks there. It tells you what to do this month. Um, you know, the, the Apostles' Creed, you're memorizing the first line of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And then the verse we already covered, Hebrews 11.1, 1, where we want to be able to say that. Faith is the realization of what is hoped for, evidence of things not seen, right? Protestants take it, you know, take us to the bank on like, they can just quote scripture, verse and chapter, right? They, they, got, they got it down. Uh, and I'm not saying we should try to compete with that, but it is nice when we can at least know a couple of key verses. And this is why each month there's one verse to work on. What is faith? It's a realization of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. 
Um, so that's, you know, so, and the idea is you would cut that out, and put it on your fridge. So every time you walk by or get a snack or whatever, you can just like, you can work on it and you can say, oh yeah, I need to make sure my kids learn this this month. Um, things to do. So today normally would be the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, but because it's Sunday, he gets bumped. It's okay. He doesn't get a feast this year. Um, however, in honor of him, we will do the passing, the passing of the blets, <laughs> the blessing of the pets um, this month. We'll do it October 24th. I have it on there, right? At 10 a.m. in front of the church. Bring your pets. I'll sprinkle them with some holy water. Okay. And in honor of St. Francis of Assisi, so you can go ahead and write that on your fridge page. And then it encourages you to go on a nature walk and experience the beauty of God's creation. Especially now, man, it is good to go for a hike. Um, now then, uh, page 13, the car tag, right? The idea is you would cut that out and hang it from your mirror, although that thing is large. I drive a Prius. If I hung that from my mirror, I wouldn't be able to see out of half my windshield. Uh, so you may want to reduce it or whatever, or, or, or find another way to put it on the back of the seat or the dashboard or whatever. The idea is that it's just there to like remind you when you're driving to and from events, school, soccer, whatever, to just bring up conversations to talk about faith, right? And to talk about God's creation, right? We believe in God. We believe he created the universe. So let's talk about that this month so that this faith thing is not a, like, stilted, like, sit down, do these activities. Like, it's part of the ongoing conversation and life of your, of your family. And then you'll look at pages 15 and 26. You can look at either one of them, and you'll see... Those each lessons kind of gives you a quick outline. So every lesson has um, six, five, five activities, right? Five activities that are rooted in that lesson. You do not have to do every activity, right? Depending on how many children, what ages the children are, you pick out which activities, maybe do three or four of them um, that you think are fitting. And they run about 10 to 15 minutes each. Most of them are in the activity book, right? And they will tell you where you can find all that. Um, as you flip through, right? On each activity, if you look at page 17, I'll look at the trust walk, which is a great little activity for, for little ones or even middle school kids. Um, where the idea is you kind of, you know, you lead them around blindfolded and they have to trust you <laughs> where you're going to walk, you know, and you kind of talk about like this walking. It's like, it's not blind faith because I know I trust the person leading me. Maybe don't want to let siblings do this to each other because I would totally run my brother into a wall because um, it's funny. But, you know, maybe don't do that. And to make the point, like you can trust someone who's leading you. Um, and so but before you begin, you want to make sure that you like, you know, the key concepts. It tells you before you begin, you need to know to believe means to accept as truth, to expect with hope, to have trust, to have faith. So that when you go to explain afterwards, what's this trust walk about? You're articulating, you're explaining what's there. And so, yeah, you just pick out the activities that you maybe think, oh, that'll be fun. I could do that. We could do that. I'd like that. Um, and then lastly, you may remember last month I talked about the storybook activity and asked you maybe you should get some a scrapbook of some kind. Um, and each month you're going to contribute to the scrapbook. So I do ask that you try to do the, – it's the fifth activity for the second lesson, your family Genesis story on page 38. And this idea of, like, we learned about creation today. We learned about Genesis. You're going to be talking about that with your kids in these activities. But one of them is like, let's talk about the origin of our family. And we're going to do this sort of scrapbook that talks about like our family's journey with God as we work our way through like God's journey through history. Um, and so it's just to add to the scrapbook to do your family Genesis activity. And then we'll have those scrapbooks at the end of the year. So just encourage you to do that. It's another way, again, to sort of like make it a part of this ongoing process, not just like we sit down in a classroom once a month and do a thing, but we have this sort of ongoing culture that we're building in the family for the faith. Questions about that? Okay. Announcements. So family night this month is October 21st at 6 p.m. It's a Wednesday night. We, we, we do one Sunday. We do one Wednesday night. Um, but I encourage you all to be there. We have to do every year safe environment. Right, which is sort of, and to make this poignant, it just came out two, three days ago that another priest in New Orleans um, admitted to having, you know, done inappropriate things with a child, right? and he's been removed. As soon as the bishop found out, 
gone instantly. So they investigated some unusual text messages, nothing too clear. But in the conversations they were having with him, he eventually admitted to something that happened in the past. And they moved him as soon as they, they ripped him. He's off. He can no longer minister. This is why we have those things in effect, right? People saw, his parents saw the text messages, said that's not appropriate, brought it to the right authorities, right authorities investigated. That kid, nothing happened to that kid, but something had happened before. And because they were investigating this one, they found out about the former one. Right, and this is one of the reasons we do safe environment, is because we get the parents and the kids to recognize certain boundaries so that we can protect them from people who are misusing their position. Um, so that's why it's in place, and it does work. Right, He got caught later than he should have, but he did get caught, and he's out of ministry, um, and he's going to answer for it. It's been reported to the police and all that. So... Um, this is why once a year we have to do it with our lesson. You know, if you can't be there, I understand, but like, this is what we're going to do. And so we'll have the parents in one place. We'll have the kids broken in different groups and we'll do age appropriate activities. I promise I will vet them personally. I know there was some fuss about last year. There was some miscommunication and some things did not got out of the wrong hands. I will make sure personally this time that uh, the people are seeing appropriate material for the sake of our protection. And so that we can have, again, a safe environment. I don't want you to not trust me, but part of you trusting me is that like, I, we make clear the boundaries and we all follow them. So that's what this is about. Uh, lastly, I do like to feed you, but it'd be nice if I could get some volunteers to help with food. Anybody want to volunteer to do some food for about 30 people? I think is what we had last time on the 21st. Anybody? Okay. The Martins will take it. Great. Thank you. Um, and then... You can find supplements. If you go to the parish website, you can find this link because it's kind of long and complicated. Um, that gives all kinds of supplements to what I just taught you, as well as supplements specifically for each lesson. So it'll tell you lesson one, here's some great videos you might want to watch. Here's some, you know, some great clips or whatever that you want to include. Um, so some good stuff on there. You'll also see like my lecture notes and things that I'm using. <laughs> if you really want to look at that, you can. Um, but that link is on the parish website under the religious education schedule. And then form.org, I gave you the forms to sign up for that. I just recommend, um, if you go there now, you'll find the video on St. Francis. It's a good video to watch. That's the saint of the month, is St. Francis of Assisi, like everybody's favorite. Um, some good videos on there. There's a bunch of different ones. Check it out. Um, and as always, uh, Formed has a lot of resources. The Symbolon series, I highly recommend. You can find some videos on there about faith if you're interested. Just more resources for you to use. Okay, then. Any other questions or concerns? All right. Well, um, thank you all for your time and attention, and we will close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of our faith, uh, the opportunity to know you, to enter into this relationship of love and of trust. Uh, we ask that you speak specifically to those places where we struggle to trust you, Lord, um, that you increase our faith, that you reassure us by signs of your providence, um, that we may accept what is true, that we may live it and love it and rejoice in it for eternity. So we pray glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, y'all, go in peace. <laughs>